I think because of just being self-taught, I think I almost feel like a bit of a cottage industry, like uh, right. of an artist. Like I don't, I don't find like uh, that my work is has like an international scope or whatever. It's right. more localized, like you know what I mean. Like whereas I think the films or music would have a more of an international scope. It's one thing maybe you know. I've been poor as a very poor artist all my life, so I've right. had, I've run out of materials a lot. In fact, yeah. even now I paint not with selected paints, but with paints that I can get from the graffiti gallery, their basement that, you know, mist tints, right. stuff like that, you know, or I'll buy the odd solid colors, whatever. Right. So, I mean, very often people will throw out just nice pieces of lumber that they were going to make a shelf with, but just decided that, oh, I never made the shelf, it's time to like throw stuff out. You can be right. amazing how much great wood there is out there. Yeah. Sometimes there's just wood that's broken that has character. Like it's like a snapped, a, a splintered plank yeah. or something. They have a lot of character in them. So sometimes, uh, you know, I'll get that. Uh, I haven't really finished a lot with that. But just the board itself is good. Then I'll just saw off the part that's there. Right. You know I mean? Yeah. Uh, other times it just might be a unique type looking thing, like an old game or... Like I found, I have a check, a check old checkers board that like made out of wood though. Right. Like chess. That I'm thinking I have to do something geometric with. Well... Um, just very often I'll do either pretty much, you know, try to be 90, uh, 90 degree or, uh, one, whatever, 180 degree, like lines, you know, a Mondrian Lin or Mondrian type or even Newman, that kind of thing. Right. Like working in that, or even the, like the more, uh, like Stella, that kind of stripe stuff. I right. like, I like that sort of really austere, uh, straight line thing. But then I, I'm almost I always will then use some randomness in the color design. Yeah. I might pick like four colors to start it, like go, okay, I want to start with this, then using those colors like big random things and make parallel lines, like echo lines. And but, I, but I also, the other types I do with geometric abstraction is I'll spin uh, stuff onto the canvas or painting or board, right. and then that'll pick the direction of the lines. Okay. And so I have a work in the show idea. for that. Backyard Fancy is that, done that way. The material surface application. That's, uh, <laughs> well, let's start with that one. That one is just when I got paint, like I would work on paintings where I would pour and scrape and I just couldn't get it and the stuff would build up so much on the surface. Right. That's one thing. Plus that also you did a lot of work on found boards that I'd find yeah. in the back that had surfaces that were rough and not good for geometric stuff or even pouring. Right. That would just be too there. It was just, even with the pouring, you'd think it would help pouring to have surface undulations, but it wouldn't. Like in some cases, it just was too apparent. So what I started doing is then just finding like wrapping paper, old paper, anything that I had, stuff that you would have uh, plastic bags for vegetables at the store, whatever. And I started applying that painting, then applying that to the thing, right. and then painting over it and maybe applying more just to build it up to get go with a rough surface, but kind of be able to work with it. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. And then I found out I was just getting with those materials. When you paint on them with watery paint, a brush with like watered down paint, you get all sorts of weird like um, shadows and moods and modeling going on. Right. Most of my material paintings come from paintings that I built up the surface so much, trying things over and over and not getting anywhere. Right. Once it reaches a certain point of, uh, of like say I've scraped if I do scrapes and I have to scrape four, five, six times, you know, it's pretty thick. It's getting pretty thick now. Right. So I just, it's starting to get where it's not that usable. And so I just feel, why don't I do that? It's a good candidate for it because I like the, you know, I like to always do the different methods, one of each, not on a set time level, but just every month I'm working on at least one of each kind. Well, let's talk about pouring the paint for now. Like, how are you set up for that? Uh, how, do you, how do you approach that? I guess the main, the important thing is the viscosity, like how much water I add. Yeah. I can do, usually I get the best results if I start really watery and then start having less and less watery because some yeah. combinations are really neat when you put a thicker one into a, quite a lake of watery paint. Like uh, you can really get some incredible effects. Like the, the, the paint will just start spreading out like in a very right. strange way, like uh, very organic, almost like cell, cellular. Right. You know, ways like that. Uh, but, you know, not, and another criteria I use is also just as what kind of a line do I want? So is it tilted more? Is it, am I trying to go as flat as possible to create a lake of colors on top, sort of, that are right. barely moving? And then I, what I do is I adjust it to move it a little bit this way, 
you know, so that's the thing. It, it wants to go towards the side, but I can keep adjusting it so that it stays kind of more lake-like. But then others I start right away with just either a complete thing like that, which I don't do too much, or less of a curve so that you get almost rivulets going. But I can manipulate the canvas usually to, so that, say, it's going in one direction. Yeah. Then I don't want it to go in that direction, so I'll slightly raise a side and move it, like make it go in a different direction. And then, you know, of course the colors are mixing differently that way. That's how I work with it. It's like, uh, um, it's almost like doing music in a way, like how yeah. you, if you're playing music and you're kind of improvising, yeah. and then you're thinking, wow, I like that color there. What yeah. if I do it a little louder? Yeah. Then the other musicians react and it becomes, it goes into a place that's really, wow, we did that together without planning it. And that's what I'm kind of doing when I'm adjusting the canvas and it's, the lake is kind of moving around. And so the lake I keep pouring and pouring and pouring if right. I need to. I usually do a lot. Um, because then it, then I have to leave it to settle for a while. Yeah. And go do other things for 15 or 20 minutes and see where, if, it, if, I, if I finally made it to be the right area and it's flowing in the right way, yeah. then I go, okay, it looks like it's going to end up in an interesting way. See, it's probably best if I, the least pouring I do for finished work, the better it will probably be. That's right. one of the challenges. To not yeah. over pour. Because what happens with those paintings is that when you over pour, then you have to start, you have to really get more detailed and then keep pouring. And then you can save a painting like I did recently with a commission painting. Yeah. I thought I'd wrecked it because I thought I clogged it. Yeah. But no, I kept going and I created a balance in it. And it's quite right. busy. But, but I think, you know, the real challenge would be to do a minimal pour and get the results. The least pouring amount of pouring would be the best. Then I would get an austere kind of uh, because the thing about it is like, um, say I could do like a perfect one where I had one color and then I poured just a perfectly thicker but still running paint into it and it created that shape that I said was like a cell. If I could just do two pours and it could work out, that would be great. But what you don't, what what was not being said, the simplicity of the two pours isn't the actual finished image isn't simple. Right. It's incredibly complex. Right, right, right. It, that's the but the thing. the action that of they're... doing it is simple. Right. But no, recognizing that that's going to work. Right. When you do it and you go, that seems like you almost have to be like a geologist in a way. Like, where is this going? You know, and or be aware of river flows yeah. or flowing. Yeah. Mech me me uh, mechanics, like in ter not in terms of learning it, but just intuitively, because then you have to get you have to think that seems like it's going to work, and you have to leave it alone. The scraping. Yes. Well, that's, uh, that's, I guess I just was quite influenced by, say, uh, Gerhard uh, Richter on that one, because right. he does the squeegee stuff, and that was probably the most one, but I don't, yeah, I guess I get sort of similar results. That might be the most derivative kind of work I do, like, just based on him, but I don't really use the colors he uses. Plus, I try to do, it might almost be closer to, I really like the, the uh, what's uh, Paul, uh, the Boudoir, the Canadian, the Quebecer, who used oh. the spatulas with the oil paint. Paul Emile Boudoir, yeah. the adamant, adamantist, and really like the thick applying of paint in an abstract way. Right. And where it's really like thick, like icing sort of thing. You know what I mean? So mine's sort of like, I am, I'm affected by Richter, but at the same time I like those, that older school that would just put a slab of paint and move it. Right. You know what I mean? I like that the thick loaded brush, and I like uh, even like someone like that Antonio Tap Tapas, uh, Spanish painter from the '60s, and he's still around too. But '50s and '60s, he had a very like kind of thick thing going on there where he mixed dirt with paint, right. put that on, and then scraped some of it away. So I've always liked that kind of thing where there's like a topology on there, or mm. you know. And so I get I get that with scraping where you can really sometimes you do it in a way that right. you have a, a thick doll up there, sitting there. Yeah. And then the way it dries can be, be very weird sometimes. It'll dry in really unexpected ways. That's okay. the fun thing, is getting up the next day, in the morning and looking at the painting right away, and saying like, oh, that blossomed in something. You know what I mean? Yeah. And same with the pouring, like, you know, of course, when you've decided, okay, that's it for today, and you get up the next day, and you see, oh, okay, you know? Well, that's <laughs> a new thing that I have that I just totally discovered. I didn't set out a plan out to do it. But it's called um, Portraits of Friends with Objects. And it's in their installation pieces, or it, piece so far. And what I did was I was, uh, it, here's more found stuff, of course, which is right. interesting because you find friends. Right. You don't program to get friends. They find them through 
if it's at work, you know what I mean, or whatever. My boss at work it actually turned out to be my friend too, which is right. really good. And so I was, I was driving across the field here at uh, Westminster Community Club, and, or um, North Broadway, whatever it's called, West Broadway. And uh, I saw in the field there was like about a four foot, four and a half foot long piece of cardboard that was curved like this and was white on the edges and, and on the inside was kind of like a dull brownish gray or whatever. And uh, I was going to thinking, well, I will definitely could paint that. That could be cool as a painting, as a kind of a sculptural thing. Uh, I could play with the colors with that, very cool. But then when I brought it home and I had it in my place, for some reason it reminded me of my boss. And it was very unique because I wasn't looking for it to do that. And I just hit on the idea, like, why did I just have it as a piece, just a tribute to him, like a portrait of him? You know what I mean? Right. And why it does, I mean, I could say why it does in some ways. Like, the white of it reminds me of the white shirts he wears a lot. The corner is kind of like his way of negotiating as a boss, where he's very willing to do cut, like, you know, to make the point instead of being up opposites, to kind of come that far to make it more like that, the point. And so that way it persuades you to kind of go in his direction because he's showing you he's going in his dire your direction a bit. You know what I mean? Like, it's sort of he's good yeah. at that and as a boss. And, and that, those things just, you know, and even the height, the way, the way it, it's there against the wall reminds me. Even the humor in it, I think. He's a humorous guy, too. It's neat because just in this simple object already, like, look at these meanings that are tumbling out of it. And I'm sure there'll be more to come. And in fact, it's the, it's the difference, like, it, it's for sure come to me, like I just said a second ago, the difference is the important thing. It's how it doesn't relate that is so important. Because it, then it gives you the possibility of somehow, you know, you have to work to relate it. And, you know, and you have to think it's possible to relate it. Because I've said it's a portrait. At some point you broke from aging, making features to... Uh, uh, more abstract film. Yeah. Well, I read a very important book, Allegories of Cinema. Okay. I'm not sure, I can't remember who the author was, but it talked about Warhol, Brackage, Michael Snow, people like that. Um, even the Couture brothers, I'm not sure if that's how you pronounce their name, even uh, John Waters' early films, I think. Right. Just this idea of just somehow making films, but that definitely weren't norm, in the norm, but some were incredibly experimental. Right. Just, I mean, because having come from narrative, yeah. um, even experimental narrative, like it was just re really refreshing to find out that there was all sorts of things you could do with film, all sorts of emotions you could get that weren't tied to narrative. Like I just started like a second romance with film for me to discover right. that. And then I made like I went for about a decade, made a lot of experimental like scratch films, found footage, uh, random, using random elements again. Uh, randomly cutting stuff together. I mean, maybe my most complicated experimental film I did was one called Run Yard Chance Memory. And that had, uh, it was a part of a Bolex experiment, so you got like about five, well you got about, you got uh, about five minutes of film. Yeah. Two 100 foot rolls. But I intended to use the negative and the positive. They were color. Right. And what I did is I did, I had like a program set up where the first roll I, I looked forward and I ran from the front yard to my backyard, and then back that way. Then I looked at my feet, and I ran there and back. Then I looked at the at my face in the sky, ran back. Then I looked sideways, ran back for sideways. That that was real one. Real two was just exploring the yard in any way I wanted to, but walking through it, right. doing shots of it. But it was all moving shots though. Then what I did is I took both rolls, negative and positive, and I cut them in down to as low as eight seconds and up to about 30 seconds. Right. And then I randomly made a grid to edit them together into two reels. Right. And played them at once. Or no, one reel, sorry. And then, so that's where it was like you had both, so you technically had, saw both, you know, like, like right. you saw every shot twice, one in positive, one in negative. Right. But in different ways and unexpectedly and, and colliding with other things. So that's, that was that film. So that was just a high amount of randomness in that. So... I was really looking in the randomness to find new rhythms. Okay. That I thought, I really do randomness to make discoveries of things that I wouldn't have thought of with my ego-based right. things or with my training. And like, so very, I mean, you are disappointed a lot with randomness, but very often you just will see things that you make these discoveries with it. And I really right. like that. So it, it's, it's kind of, that way it becomes more about finding than creating a story. Yes. Uh, right. Well, I mean, but you create, the stories created retroactively. Right. Yeah. 
but you you kind of set up a uh, like in in that in that in that uh, in in that film you're setting up a, a structure right a process yeah. and the finished product is uh, not just a result of the structure but also a result of decisions you made yeah based on finding things as you went sure discoveries and, and maybe that's maybe that's where like a story like tension emerges yeah. is in like the the cold hard structure logical structure mixed with my intuitive way of trying to um, dance inside of it somehow yeah. and create things you know up against the structure maybe that's where the sort of story like quality comes from yeah is in that tension between the two things on the subject of film I wanted to, uh, to throw something you uh, quote the uh, back at, at you and see how you react to it something you said when we were meeting earlier about the uh, about the show is that if I can find where I wrote it down exactly. Okay. Uh, a relationship is a found footage project. Ah, uh, right. Well, it's definitely, yeah, because, you know, you're both bringing your stories. Right. That, but then meshing them together in a way that, you know, having to fragment them in certain ways. Or, you know, that's what's neat about a relationship is how you, you do understand what the person is doing and you like the same things or you do. That's the part where it right. kind of glides together nicely. But then there are the other parts where they collide and have to be fragmented into something else. So it's like, you know, yeah, you, the found footage is each of your own histories, kind of. So is a found footage project also a relationship? Oh, definitely, yeah. For sure. Like, like all, I mean, like I think virtually every type of art you can do is some kind of relationship that you're right. having with, you know what I mean? With being a, an artist, with, with it, you know, holding the mirror of the work up in front of your face, you know, to see yourself. And so is it a relationship with yourself then? Uh, no, not just yourself, because it's outside. It's, like, right. you know, it's, like, it's from the exterior. Although, you know, I guess we do have a relationship with ourselves too, in, with other people, like it's a way of relating who we are to right. ourselves through what we also, their responses are. We also learn about ourselves from yeah, yeah. kind of other people in a way. Yeah. Uh, because I don't even think that a pain, like some of the paintings have relationships with each other. Yeah. You know, I mean, there's no doubt about that, right? And isn't it neat how, like, in a relationship with, say, a, a, like a romance or whatever, right? that in a way, too, the next time you reach a part where you have a problem, you might have a better way of dealing with it. Right. In a more su subtle or diplomatic way. Yeah. Doing less or something or knowing when to stop or knowing whatever. That In that way, it's very much like a relationship with a person. But I mean, yeah, it's more like I'm saying that, tips. like, whereas, like, say a relationship would be like found footage. The installation is more like me um, saying, I'm not going to work with found footage. Like, I'm, yeah. it'd be as if I made a dramatic film to describe a found footage film. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> as if a found footage film gave me an idea to, to drama, make a more right. like, linear narrative about it, like a story, like a clear-cut story with morals. Like, that's, that installation is more like that. It has, it has like, a moral or an ethical idea in it. You know, it's right. making a moral statement oh, about okay. commitments. You know what I mean? About, say, uh, that you have to open yourself up. You have to even drill deep. You know, you have to almost wound yourself to open yourself up to these things that, in the end, can make you even more full of pain. Right. You know what I mean? But, you know, you, so in a way, you have to wound yourself to be open enough to have a, a relationship, but then with the risk of even being more pain later. Right. But that's just, it's all worth it in the end. I mean, to me, I mean, I'm not a cynical person about relationships, like some people are, or maybe right. even the culture is to some degree, but I'm not. Like, I, I think it's fully worth it every time to do it, you know, to make that sacrifice. And maybe, I mean, since I've gone through a similar thing in my life recently, that, that to make a story, a clear-cut story about it is better than to just throw it up in the air and see where it comes down. Maybe right. it's more like, you know, it's a way to find ground again and, and, you know, like scramble out of the water into the land again, you know? I mean, I don't really, now I have most of my instruments, I don't really right. love them. Really well, I, I mean, if something comes up, like recently, some uh, regular at Zed that comes there uh, always brings things to the to me and the owner. Right. And just like just things that he sees at the Salvation Army or whatever. And so for Christmas he brought a weird kind of glass thing that looked like 
a martini glass except with a long stem. Right. And it had a candle in it and just some Christmas ornaments on it. And I just right, right away recognized that that glass thing would probably sound good. And when I held it the right way, it had three distinct tones. Right. So I just knew right away I was going to use that in, a, in an upcoming show. And so that's cool. So I've added to my arsenal. That just came by randomness there. Right. But I don't really seek out things. I mean, obviously, if I'm walking down the back alley or something, and I see something, and I can just know, oh, that's going to have a good sound. I can right. test things. And also, I'm waiting for the bus or whatever. I test poles. Yeah. I know that there's stuff. Because that is one element that I want to work on more is going to where sounds are out in the city right. and stuff and playing them live now that right. I have the, the live portable recorder Yeah, and making stuff out of that. That's right, because you, you are incorporating more digital now. Oh so yeah, You've always sure. worked with the uh, with pedals and live, samples yes. live. Yes, yeah. Uh, but now I'm actually creating sounds through recording, like I went right. up to Clear Lake and had a friend throw pebbles and logs and that into the water and a, a piece came out of that that I've already pre premiered right. live. What about... Um, Using the graffiti gallery itself as an instrument. Yeah, we did. Yeah, I do that quite a lot because they have a catwalk there that's very bassy. Yeah. In fact, one of the interesting things they did, we did an old show around 2006 called Paper, and we incorporated some hip hop people, uh, Rough, and then DJ Brace also. But at one point, I was doing. I had simulated with uh, Sarah in Suture. Uh, I was playing the catwalk with a heavy board as the bass drum, and she was playing a pole, and we were doing a hip hop beat. But that way, he was rapping to it, mm -hmm. and I like that a lot. Like I like stuff yeah. like that. I think that's very cool. At some point, you went from doing philia or doing moment device to philia. Did that reflect a, as like a change in process? Or? No, it reflected a change in attitude about art. Okay. Because at the point, at that point in my life, I was like doing art, and that was like when I was probably in my mid forties, and I was doing art that I was doing for myself as twenty two. Right. And the, those ways for those reasons for doing art were running out, okay. like really running out. They weren't valid anymore. So I had to rethink about why I was doing art, and that's why. And the word philia is like a main reason I'm doing it is that it's the fraternal bond of the community or whatever. Right. It's that idea that you know, uh, you know, it's not about being a cool musician who's you know revered by people or whatever, which I might have wanted when I was in my twenties, right. or being you know famous to some degree. It's more of just finding community that accepts what you do. Because when I do a good showdown and get a good response, I feel like I'm welcome home in a way. You know what I mean? It's like, here, here is your family or whatever. Yeah. It's not like I'm above them or they're re revering me or right. something. Like, not that I really wanted that, but you know what I mean? I just, it really brought home the idea that it's a family, a community thing. So I really wanted that to be my name. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. that's what I'm offering. You know what I mean? And, and of course, doing very avant-garde music. Because one of the best re best responses I get, and I get it a lot, is I've never seen anything like that. So isn't it weird that I'm trying to stay, you know, come and welcome to my home, yet it's like, it's not a familiar place. I yeah. like that. And that's what the good strength about art, is you can do radical, unfamiliar, even threatening things without hurting anybody, really. Yeah. You can, or you can introduce people to alien ideas that are really warm inside. Like, you know, you don't have to be scared of them. If you investigate them, they're actually neat and warm and personal. You know what I mean? Like, you yeah. know, it's like, I tried to say, someone from the CBC once, once asked me about experimental music, and I said, people are so alienated about it, they're scared of it, it's like, it's an alien thing. But really, it's very personal music. If you give it a chance, just think of it as a new possible friend, when you go and encounter something like avant-garde that you're not sure about, that you've never seen anything like it and you're threatened by it. Instead, think of it not as a threatening presence, but as a potential good friend that you might have. You know what I mean? Right. Because don't we meet a lot of people where at first we're a little put off by them, or you're, we're not sure, and then, you know what I mean? Yeah. Because it really, the experimental music is very personal. If it's nothing else, it's personal. That's one thing about the avant-garde that people don't get, you know, with all the, we're trying to shock you or whatever. Really, to do music like that is a personal quest, because you're, you're not getting a lot else out of it, not, not financial or words or whatever, you know what I mean? I guess with painting, you're always trying to do something that's maybe never been done before, but I guess there's so many, uh... Maybe my music is more, it's way more designed to be really startlingly kind of new to people that see it for the first time. Right. I think my painting is, is still pretty derivative from a certain like style of painting that people yeah. can recognize, or even design even. You know what I mean? Like, right. uh, I think pouring now is pretty accepted by almost, even the average person in the street that doesn't know anything about painting gets the idea of throwing paint at the canvas, even if they don't yeah. like it or think it's easy they do understand the idea of it, like that it's, 
that it's a valid way to express yourself and it doesn't have to be great art. Right. But I think, I, mean, I don't know about valid, they, they see it as that's a painter does that. He throws paint at a painting and he gets results. That's too easy, I don't accept it, whatever. Right. But I still agree that they do it. You know what I mean? Like yeah. painters do things like that. I think people that say they're very correct in saying that Pollock though, say a guy like Pollock unleashed something that I don't think is even anywhere near complete. Right. Like a sort of, because you know, look what happened after Pollock with happenings. Look at all yeah. the things that he influenced. You know what I mean? Because in a way, you know, on that you're saying you're just throwing stuff at the cameras. Oh, then you can do anything and call it art. That whole criticism becomes a liberation. Right. You know what I mean? Like to people to say, oh, you can do anything in color art. But I think with the sound, it's more, it's trying to be more, I mean, one of its leading qualities is its un unpredictability. Right. Would be something, like hopefully within that, there's some real um, focused and, um, yeah, focused and even beautiful, I don't know what the right word is, but things that make sense, there's a logic in it. Like even though it seems to be being made up in the spot, which it is a lot, but hopefully that's what gets you to go like kind of lose your age and go, I'm a little kid looking at this now. I don't know how to describe it. It's not like a good or bad blues song. It's just, I have to make up the rules for understanding it. Right. Hopefully that's mediated by a sense of a logic that you're actually going somewhere. So you're getting those two things at once. I don't think I'm not necessarily getting that with the, my visual arts of painting. Right. I think I'm just, uh, there's less so that surprise of the new and more hope, not more hopefully, but I think with my painting it's more the logic of that works out in a certain way, the balance of it, the composition. Uh, maybe the newness is coming is in with the randomness, maybe using random juxtapositions of colors is creating some new relationships. But I think we're so inundated by design and visual design and, and the history of art is so in front of our eyes all the time, even as parody, that I don't, it's, I don't know, like I, I, maybe maybe with sound you can still do newer things than you can do with painting. I don't know, you know? It seems now with painting, the newness is in the stories you tell with paintings, not the combination of colors and lines and stuff. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah, because although different way. Oh. I still see abstractions that are very new to me, like, you know what I mean? Where uh, maybe that's so built into abstract painting, anyways, that yeah. where it's not when you pay, when you play music in front of people, it's not. It's more built in as that what kind of music you play. Right. Is it good or bad version of that? Is it kind that I can relate to or not? Right. I mean, the blues is the perfect thing. You can play the blues well, or you can play them poorly. There's some subjectivity in it, but some people will go like, "That's not a good blues band. That's a great right. blues band." But they have rules to go to blues and right. say why it's good. Whereas with my music. Uh, maybe it's more related to abstract painting, way more related than most music is. It's you're still like you're pretty much confronted with something like, well, what are the rules of this? Just right. like when I'm painting an abstraction, I have to keep the rules are made up with each stroke that I'm doing. The new rules are made up. You know, in this talk, it's just actually occurred to me that yeah, like my music is would way more be like uh, like my music is actually very related to my painting. Way more than most bands, uh, like of any, of any kind. Like yeah. Any. So it's like it's like I really stick out that way. Like there's not a lot of bands you can say I like an abstract painting.